Ladies and gentlemen, good morning, good afternoon. Sorry for the slight delay in starting. It's been a challenge to do it uh, in a hybrid manner, but I think we're getting there. <clears throat> and I just wanted to uh, briefly say welcome and also to inform you that this, this session will be um, including speakers who will join us from India, from Australia, I have two of my colleagues sitting to the right of me, <clears throat> and it is <clears throat> focusing on a topic which I think we all agree on this. It's, it's a very important topic about the plurilaterals <clears throat> and to what extent, <clears throat> excuse me, the plurilaterals <clears throat> fit or do not fit or not yet fit enough into the multilateral context of the WTO. Um, we will have a very limited amount of time, but <clears throat> nevertheless, I hope that those of you who would like to address questions to the speakers, please uh, send your questions. We might not be able to answer all of them, but they will be recorded. And I think also uh, the speakers, uh, if they are addressed to them, they will take time to read and maybe get back to you <clears throat> um, at a later time. So. <clears throat> Now, let me start. Um, I already mentioned myself, I'm um, Emeritus Professor from the University of Basel <coughs> in Switzerland, and also co-founder of uh, the Center for Socioeconomic Development, which is a 27-year-old NGO, EcoSoc accredited, based here in Geneva. We're focusing on trade and development. And I will also introduce each one of the speakers in more detail. Here, you got an overview. <coughs> Let me move on uh, to the next slide, but it doesn't move. Maybe here. Maybe you have to go large. Yeah, that's correct. I would like to start um, remembering and invite you all to remember what's in the preamble of the WTO, because some of this uh, that I'm going to read briefly will maybe come up during our discussions. So the preamble here says, <clears throat> Uh, the parties to this agreement recognizing that their relations in the field of trade and economic endeavor should be conducted with a view of raising standards of living and ensuring full employment and a large and steadily growing volume of real income and effective demand and expanding the production of and trade in goods and services while allowing for the optimal use of the world's resources in accordance with the objective of sustainable development. That was written already 1995. And to seek both to protect and to preserve the environment and to enhance the means for doing so in a manner consistent with their respective needs and concerns at different levels of economic development. Recognizing further that there is a need for positive efforts designed to ensure that developing countries, and especially the least developed among them, secure a share in the growth in international trade commensurate with the needs of their economic development. Just want to put this briefly in front of all of us because some of the issues that have come up in the discussions about plurilaterals of course, pertains also to the inclusion of developing countries. Now, <clears throat> briefly, you all know, <clears throat> since the start of the GATT and then the WTO, there have been several rounds of negotiations, as you see on this slide and this table, starting from 1947, going down to 2001. 
And you see also the number of the countries, of course, that has increased. And we're here at this, at this, at the time and at the place where the so-called Doha round, as we all know, is not finished. It's incomplete. We're 20 years in the way, 20 years in the making. And this waiting of concluding and finishing a round called the Doha round corresponds to the next slide with what you see on this chart, which is, of course, as you all know, also the increase of FTAs, also RTAs. So while we have, in a way, a stalemate, you could say, about the Doha round, and we're waiting, there's an increase of FTAs and also initiatives of a plurilateral kind. Next one. So plurilateral and multilateral agreements, just a few words about it. We have a sub variety of multilateral negotiations where a minority of members of a multilateral body, such as the WTO, agrees to a deal which they hope will be accepted by the rest of the members at the later stage, called later multilateralization, as was the case, for instance, with the ITA, the Information Technology Agreement. Two, the WTO agreement establishes a set of disciplines related to plurilateral agreements. However, the link between plurilateralism and multilateralism needs to be analyzed from a legalistic, from a legal perspective, as well as from a political perspective, in order to delineate the linkages between the two kinds of negotiation approaches, plurilateral, multilateral. Finally, plurilateral agreements can be concluded by three or more WTO members and cover trade issues that are labeled WTO, sometimes labeled WTO plus, extra or minus. They can be adopted within the WTO framework as well as outside of the WTO context. If it's outside, of course, then the issue comes up that plurilateral trade agreements could be just preferential agreements or agreements based on the most favorite nation principle. Um, well, we have one that's within the WTO actually, which is not based on the MFN principles, that's the uh, government procurement agreement, but we might be coming back to that later. So from my point of view, uh, from my perspective, I'd like to highlight a few different assumptions that are part and parcel of the discussions about plurilaterals. For instance, <coughs> trade economists often emphasize competition is necessary in order for uh, companies to come up with new products in order to have efficiency gains through higher productivity to create global wealth or increase in global wealth. Hence, if WTO consensus is blocking new initiatives that could lead to competitiveness and to creation um, of what will not be possible, then plurilaterals could be the answer uh, to create the right context for competition to take place and for new products to be uh, invented. However, also from a conventional political scientist perspective, of course, then the question comes as to the distribution of gains achieved through, for instance, uh, competitiveness. Often the rich become richer and the poor and the, the developing countries are may, maybe are left behind. Well, from a conventional trade officials uh, perspective that I often heard in developing countries are saying, FTAs are biased towards industrialized countries. Uh, developing countries and least developed countries do not have means and resources to effectively compete with the industrialized and, and advanced economies. Finally, I would say the WTO rounds is an exchange of concessions. That's how it always has been organized, where offensive and defensive interests of countries, of member countries, are exchanged within a multilateral context. How to apply traditional concession-based negotiations to plurilaterals is not fully clear yet. For least developed countries and developing countries, there's no certainty that the gains that might occur 
or to be generated through plurilaterals will be shared adequately and fairly with developing countries. And if not, plurilaterals are seen by developing countries, I have often hear this, as a risk, not as an opportunity. Next one. So here are the questions I've been putting to uh, our speakers. And you see it here on, on, this, on the screen. The first one is, to what extent is it possible to multilateralize plurilateralism? After 20 years of the Doha round with no agreement in sight and an increasing number of FTAs and RTAs, what could be done to multilateralize the plurilateral initiatives? And we have several, of course, as you know. Two, what are the different options to negotiate and conclude plurilateral agreements with or without most favored nation state uh, um, clause? Three, what are the implications of plurilateral agreements for the multilateral trading system, leading to more integration or fragmentation of the trading system? Four, besides services, environmental goods and investment, there could other trade areas be negotiated, negotiated also through plurilateral approaches? If so, which areas? And finally, what are the strategies and tactics available to developing and least developed countries in the negotiations of plurilateral agreements? I'm coming to the first speaker. Let me briefly introduce him, <clears throat> Peter is in Australia. He will join us uh, online. <clears throat> he is uh, with the School of Economics and Public Policy and the exec Executive Director of the Institute of International Trade in the Faculty of the Profession of the University of Adelaide in Australia. Peter is a member of the Board of Trustees of the International Chamber of Commerce Research Foundation. He's a non-resident senior fellow of the Brussels-based European Center for International Political Economy and an associated researcher at the German Development Institute and a board member of the Australian Services Roundtable. Now, Peter also has published with other colleagues just a couple of months ago, an article, very useful, very informative called Boosting the G20 Cooperation for W2, WTO Reform, Leveraging the Full Potential of Plurilateral Initiatives, G20, Task Force 3, that they published it together in, on July 7th, 2021. And this um, uh, article is available for those of you who are interested to read it. Without much further ado, I'll leave the floor now to Peter. Peter, do you hear us? Which doesn't seem Mr. The case. Mr. Draper the case. is not uh, online at the moment. years from 1994 to 2002, and in which capacity also chaired some of the WTO key councils and negotiating groups. He sub subsequently became chief of staff and special advisor to the director general of the WTO, then senior advisor to the secretary general of the United Nations Conference on Trade and Development. And he later worked for an international law firm based here in Geneva. He is currently senior consultant on the international trade for the global communications agency called Hume Brophy and is a fellow of the European Center for International Political Economy based in Brussels and the Asia Global Institute in Hong Kong. Stuart, without much further ado, you have the floor. 
Thanks very much indeed, uh, Raymond, and it's a, it's a pleasure to be to be with you. Um, I'm going to just talk briefly, addressing I think the first uh, three of your of the questions that you you, you put up on the screen, um, and I'm going to sort of canvas or cover uh, three categories or options of types of plurilateral outcomes in the WTO and touch briefly on their advantages and disadvantages. Uh, these are not official categories, these are my concepts, if you like, as to how plurilaterals work. Uh, two of the three uh, categories I'm going to mention are, in my view, relatively un uncontroversial, but, but I think they're certainly worth um, our attention. So the first one I'd like to talk about consists of recommendations and declarations by groups of members. A very good example indeed is the package recently agreed by the informal working group on MSMEs. I'm sure some uh, WTO diehards would regard this as a somewhat peripheral achievement in the legalistic WTO setting that we're all used to, but I take a contrary view. To me, it's a very good example of a much needed deliberative and policy oriented approach that has been so sadly lacking in the WTO since its establishment. Sometimes we have to build brick by brick and who knows where such approaches might lead in the long term. I think we can also look to APEC to see what can be achieved in this area on a voluntaristic basis over a long period of time. So I uh, would like to heartily congratulate those involved in the outcome on MSMEs, and I hope others will follow in their footsteps. The second uh, option or category that I'd like to cover for accommodating plurilateral outcomes in the WTO is what I call rather in a rather cumbersome way, concerted autonomous MFN scheduling, C-A-M-S or CAMS for short. The examples we have in this area are the information technology agreement and the basic telecoms reference paper. These involve groups of members having completed negotiations plurilaterally, assuming increased commitments of their own volition through their individual schedules on an MFN basis. However, they did so in a concerted way, so as to be assured of maintaining a critical mass in terms of both coverage and quality. Techniques involved exchanging indicative draft schedules, and in the case of telecoms, a reference paper and a protocol. This is broadly the approach now being followed in the current joint initiative on services domestic regulation, which I understand may well come to fruition based on a reference paper at MC12. I know that there are some differences of opinion as to the desirability or even the legality of this approach. However, it would seem to me to be a travesty if members were not even able autonomously to take on additional MFN commitments in their own schedules. So CAMS for short has been shown to be effective in some subject areas, uh, whether it could be applied to even more complex agreements in future, such as perhaps investment facilitation for development needs detailed consideration. And probably there are legal and practical limits. Nevertheless, within this, within these limits, this methodology is quite equitable in my view, because of its MFN aspect, because participation is in principle open, and also because the procedures for technical certification of schedules allow for consideration of objections. The third and last category I'd like to uh, mention concerns clubs of members coalescing around certain issues. These clubs could be exclusive or they could be open to others and they could have an MFN aspect or they might not. 
currently the WTO only accommodates plurilateral trade agreements in Annex 4 to the WTO agreement. These are part of the agreement, but they don't create obligations or rights for members that have not accepted them. They could be open to new members joining, but most likely through an accession process, such as in the GPA. Under Article uh, 10, Paragraph 9 of the WTO agreement, an agreement can only be added to Annex 4 exclusively by consensus. And that's a quote. This is a very high bar. And indeed, Annex 4 has not been expanded since the WTO was established. Given the sluggishness of negotiations at the multilateral level over the last 25 years, influ influential groups of members have launched a number of open plurilateral initiatives on the margins of the WTO. Much of the motivation is serious frustration with multilateral inertia. The Doha round, which Raymond mentioned, la launched almost exactly 20 years ago, incidentally, was the last attempt to build a balanced WTO negotiating agenda with scope for trade-offs across the board. To my great regret, personally, it failed. There must now therefore be a strong case for reviewing the conditions under which plurilateral agreements can be added to Annex 4 and allowing more flexibility in the types of agreements that can be accommodated. If both the multilateral and the plurilateral routes are blocked off, some members will be looking elsewhere for solutions. And for example, uh, just to give you an example of that, there's a recent report from the Center for Strategic and International Studies in the US, which recommends the creation of a trade compact between like-minded developed countries as a competitor to the WTO. This hasn't got traction yet, but the idea is out there. Furthermore, I would add, and very paradoxically, whilst members are clinging to the consensus requirement under Article 10, Paragraph 9, they have simultaneously watered down the already very pliable rules for preferential trade agreements under GATT Article 24 and GATT's Article 5. Although the latter, it's to say, preferential trade agreements may have a different legal nature as exceptions to WTO rules, the practical effects of PTAs, preferential trade agreements, and plurilateral agreements are similar. So I say we need to look again at the conditions for adding uh, plurilateral agreements, but this is obviously far from, from straightforward. Uh, and there's a lot of issues out there that need to be addressed. For example, how open should any new plurilateral agreements be, both during negotiations and to new adherents? If joining became a question of accession, this would favor first movers and result in asymmetry in levels of commitments. The legal framework for, for Annex 4 might also need to accommodate agreements which confer rights, but not obligations on non-participants. Another issue is the scope of the subject matter of a plurilateral agreement and the level of support. Should any trade related issue be permitted, however controversial and however limited its support? I think not. Then there's the very real and important question of the institutional capacity of uh, the very large number of resource constrained developing countries. Would we need TFA style arrangements so that they're not left behind. Then again, would we need safeguards against possible inconsistency or overlap with existing multilateral agreements? There's now a degree of wishful thinking I hear in the corridors of the WTO about the Tokyo round codes, which comprise the set of essentially plurilateral agreements. My understanding that this was no was is that this was no golden age. The system became fragmented. Even the adherents of the various codes found over time that the level of participation was inadequate. Developing countries felt a sense of exclusion. 
These deficiencies indeed led to the idea of the single undertaking in the Uruguay round, meaning in those days that all members are in all agreements. So I'm not trying to make an argument against reviewing the conditions for adding plurilateral agreements to the WTO. The, the Tokyo round could be seen either as an aberration or a precursor to a fully multilateral system. Uh, I think we just need to be aware of the advantages and pitfalls. I think there is an argument for uh, the members to engage in a very serious debate about the modalities for modifying uh, the conditions for adding plurilateral agreements. And there are ideas out there, such as, for example, a possible code of contact, conduct. Summing up, uh, because I think I'm probably over time, Raymond, sorry about that. I read recently the General Council Chairman's report setting out a sort of stock taking of the issues that members had raised for MC12. To me, with my uh, more historical perspective, shall I put it that way, I found the length of this list and the breadth of the subjects raised was, was absolutely striking. I mean, the agenda is two or three times larger than it was 20 years ago. So, but that made the point to me that this organization is not irrelevant. There is clearly a demand for its services because the members are bringing up all of these issues all of the time. But we can't just keep adding to the list. We need to keep dealing with some of the is issues and taking some issues off the list. Uh, otherwise, at some point in time, we will become irrelevant. Um, I hope that point is never going to come. And I think we need to have a, a policy debate about the future of plurilateral agreements. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Yeah, um, thank you very much, uh, Stuart, uh, for the points that you made and also the uh, rather, to some extent, worrisome <clears throat> comments about the situation of, of the WTO and, and plurilaterals and the future and where we could hopefully <coughs> move to without becoming, in that sense, uh, irre irrelevant. I think without, we have complications here with the online participation of our two speakers. Maybe, Hamid, if, if it's okay, we'll move on to you. Um, so let me briefly introduce you. Next speaker being <clears throat> Mr. Hamid Mandu. I think most of you know him, uh, but just a, a few um, uh, pieces of information about his background. Prior to retiring from the WTO at the end of September 2013, uh, at that time he was the Director of Trade in Services and Investment Division here in uh, WTO. And he was, the, he was the Director since uh, May 2001 up to 2017. Previously, he was a Senior Counselor in the Trade and Services Division He's been the secretary of the WTO Council for Trade and Services since the establishment of the WTO in 1995. During that time, <coughs> he was also responsible for legal affairs relating to trade in services and the implementation of the General Agreement on Trade in Services, GATS. He was earlier during the Uruguay round of negotiations, he was responsible including legal matters relating to the negotiation, design, and drafting of the GATS. And finally, also before joining the GATS Secretariat as a dispute settlement lawyer in January 1990, he was representing Egypt at the GATT in the uh, Uruguay round negotiations on a wide range of issues, including services. Uh, Mr. Hamid Mamdou also published recently, this year, in April, a paper called Plurilateral Negotiations and Outcomes in the WTO, 
This paper is available also. Uh, Mr. Uh, Ham Hamid Mamdu works at the, is with the King and Spalding law firm here in Geneva and have great pleasure to give the word uh, to you, Hamid. Thank you very much, Raymond, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. I know we're running out of time, so I will jump straight to the content of what I would like to say. Can we move to the next slide, please? Now, uh, I think I think this is not the first slide. This is not the first slide. Yes, that's, that's all right. Now, the, the first point I, I would like to, to, to clarify here is, is the nature of this conversation. We've been having this conversation about plurilaterals uh, or what is uh, plurilateral uh, for, for so many years. And I would like to emphasize that the, this conversation is uh, of a political nature in the first order. Why? Because it's about what countries, members of the organization would like to do with, uh, with the WTO. And it's about the future of the negotiating function uh, of the WTO. And I, I would recall in 2004, there was a report that was issued. Uh, it's for, for uh, it's called the Sutherland Report. And it's a report that was actually uh, developed by a group of eminent um, uh, uh, experts, international experts, about the future of the multilateral trading system uh, in the beginning of the millennium. And one of the things that they've emphasized is the need for more variable geometry in how the negotiating function actually fulfills its purpose. And uh, when we talk about plurilaterals, and even if it is uh, a, a political conversation, I think it's terribly important that we clarify the rules. What are the rules of the game? Where are the legal lines drawn? Because this would be the starting point for a good political conversation. This is exactly like if we are embarking on a, a reform uh, a journey for the WTO, then this is like switching on your GPS. If you want to go to a certain destination, you switch on your GPS and the first thing that it gives you is your current location. And I think this is what I will try to do in this quick presentation. What is the current location? And then from point A, we decide what point B do we want to reach. Now, the, the, the WTO reform discussions have not really started in a structured way, but um, what is needed now is a political vision in which we place all those legal points. Now, in this presentation, I will focus only on the legal aspects um, uh, and the questions that relate to um, plurilateral negotiations and plurilateral outcomes. Next slide, please. Uh, I will not be discussing questions of desirability, will not be discussing uh, questions of uh, negotiating balances and critical mass, or um, the, even the important issue that Stuart has referred to about the challenge that developing countries and LDCs are facing because whether the negotiations are plurilateral or, 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 or multilateral, we do have an institutional challenge in the WTO of 164 members having equal status while they have very unequal capacity to participate. And that gap needs to be um, bridged. Now, how do we do that? This is not the subject of, of my uh, presentation now. The first step I would suggest is that is the need to clarify what are plurilaterals. And here, as you will see from this slide, I'm just trying to focus on certain distinctions that would allow us to have a fruitful conversation about, about the subject. The first is, are we talking about negotiations and outcomes inside or outside the WTO? Because so often conversations actually confuse TISA, which was taking place outside the WTO as a plurilateral, as an example for plurilateral. Uh, other uh, conversations would cite 
uh, government procurement as another example, but this kind of mixed bag approach does not actually allow us to reach any productive conclusions. So what I would say, I would focus here on negotiations inside the WTO to produce outcomes that would be housed within the WTO legal architecture. The second distinction, which is terribly important for the purpose of clarifying legal issues, is distinguishing processes and outcomes, because there are different rules that apply to both. A plurilateral negotiating process is one thing, and outcome coming out of that process and how that outcome would be integrated into the treaty architecture of the WTO is a completely different um, question in terms of the applicable rules. The third distinction is that I would distinguish between what I would call uh, agreements with capital A and agreements with small a. The agreements with capital A is what I would see as standalone agreements like the trade facilitation agreement. An agreement with small a is what I would consider to be negotiated outcomes under the auspices of one of the existing treaties, the GATT or the GATS, and those outcomes would be consolidated in schedules, an example that Stuart referred to as well. Now, we have to keep in mind that um, the, the, the important thing always in the rules that we will see is that new outcomes um, cannot adversely affect pre-existing rights of non-participating members. Uh, so what are the applicable rules about negotiations and outcomes? Next slide, please. With respect to um, negotiating processes, the negotiating function of the WTO as defined in the Marrakesh Agreement, Article 3.2, takes a very, very open approach. It does not actually uh, require that in order to launch any plurilateral negotiations um, between a subset of members, that there needs to be a consensus decision or approval by the entire membership. That requirement does not exist in the rule book. And we need to keep that in mind because it's one thing to talk about the desirability of plurilateral negotiations. It's another to talk about the legal legitimacy because there is nothing in what we see now in the um, joint statement initiative negotiations that violates any existing rule in the book. The, the same um, uh, uh, thing applies for uh, all agreements annexed to the Marrakesh Agreement. Uh, you, you will not find a requirement for a consensus decision to launch any plurilateral negotiations. To the contrary, some of the agreements like the GATS in Article 19.4 actually call upon members to engage in plurilateral negotiations. Now, plurilateral negotiating processes have also been a standard feature in the multilateral trading system since GATT 1947. So there is nothing new there. It's very important to recall all, all these facts so that we start the conversation from a, a sound starting point. And that's the usefulness, as I said, of clarifying the, the, the legal rules. Now, uh, having said all that, we need to keep in mind that negotiating processes uh, are not actually an optimal solution for everything. You cannot negotiate everything in the WTO on a plurilateral basis. A good example is all the institutional uh, issues that are under negotiation. You're not going to reform the dispute settlement system in the WTO through plurilateral negotiations. So we need to keep that in mind as well. Next slide, please. Now, applicable rules on outcomes, the rules are clear. And that's the point I would like to stress here. The rules are clear. That if we want to change them, we can change them, of course. Now, the integration of negotiated outcomes into the um, treaty architecture of the WTO, as I said, are designed to ensure coherence, but also designed to protect the legal rights of non-participants, uh, while at the same time giving legal effect to those negotiated outcomes. And there are 
procedures for that. The procedures are different depending on what kind of, of outcomes. So for example, uh, if the outcome is an agreement with small a, as I mentioned, that is new commitments to be scheduled, uh, good examples are the ITA, the, 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 the fifth protocol on financial services, um, uh, the fourth protocol on basic telecommunications. Uh, these are outcomes that are to be integrated into the mother agreement or the mothership, if you will, through uh, a certification of schedules procedure, which would allow non-participants to object if there is anything in the new commitments that adversely affect their existing rights. That is one set of procedures. There's a, there's a well-elaborated set of rules for that. The second route, the second pathway, is if you have a, a new standalone agreement, like the trade facilitation agreement. And there, you can't do that through a certification procedure, but there, there, there is a well-elaborated set of rules in Article 10 of the WTO agreement. You will have to go through an amendment procedure. Now, if the agreement we're talking about is the result of plurilateral negotiations, the day will come when the entire membership would look at the outcome and determine whether that outcome is acceptable uh, within the overall e treaty architecture. But here I come back to that important distinction between processes and outcomes. When it comes to processes, there are no legal constraints in the rule book. Now, of course, rules are created by members and they can be changed by members. There's, there's no doubt about that. But when we switch on the GPS to see where our current location is, it's important to realize that when it comes to negotiations, there are no legal constraints at all. So the day will come when those outcomes would be subject to the judgment of the entire membership to see whether there's going to be um, uh, uh, an agreement according to the procedures of Article 10 to integrate whatever outcomes there is. Now, the other point I, or the last point here that I want to emphasize is that there is no one size fits all um, to solve negotiating problems. Uh, and there is no one size fits all to accommodate or to integrate negotiated outcomes. We have to be within those rules, looking at you know, customized solutions for, for, for different situations. And if we look at the JSIs that are on the table um, at this point, you will see that each one of them actually uh, is different from the other. E-commerce is different from domestic regulation, different from investment facilitation. Uh, but the final thing that I would leave you with here is that the rules are there. And for that, last slide, please. For that, uh, I, I have uh, written a, um, uh, a paper uh, recently uh, in April about the plurilateral negotiations and outcomes in the WTO, uh, the link for which is provided in one of those slides, which we cannot find now. But uh, uh, please, if you if you wish to have access to it, I mean, you can ask me or ask um, the WTO secretariat because it is available with them as well. And let me stop here and apologize for, for, for the long presentation. Thank you, Ramon. Thank you as well. Uh, we had uh, the privilege to listen to two very inspiring and very interesting presentations. And I apologize for two of our colleagues who are out there uh, and couldn't join us. Uh, we have also a limitation in terms of time. There are eight minutes left. I think with, I hope you would agree, we have two experts right here in front of us. May I uh, maybe ask uh, Stuart, uh, would you like to re respond to what you heard from Hamid uh, and vice versa? So we can then afterwards, we can open it up to questions. Thanks, Raymond. Um, well, not really, because uh, you know I I I, I fully take on board uh, what what Hamid has said about the difference between negotiating processes and outcomes, and the and the the methodology um, and the route by which you um, legally incorporate the outcome of negotiations into the WTO. These are separate things. 
mean, plurilateral negotiations are a time-honored um, method of negotiating in the WTO and the GATT before that. Um, but it's not to be confused with how you incorporate the results of a negotiation into uh, the legal architecture. So, I mean, I, I think I'm 100% I'm with Hamid on that. Um, and I think that's all I'll say. Maybe a response from you, and I see that Peter just now finally got connected. Go ahead. Okay, no, I, I, I also concur with, uh, with what Stuart has said. The only point that I would, would, would add is that uh, I see exactly what, be, what uh, Stuart was saying about the Tokyo Round Codes, mm -hmm. but I think we are in a more uh, fortunate situation now with the WTO because we do have the legal and institutional infrastructure that we did not have then which would give us tools to work with, uh, which were not available at the time. But of course, the political uh, analogy is, is, is well taken. Thank you. Peter, do you hear us? I do, Raymond, yeah. Can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Yeah. <coughs> okay. All right. <coughs> Peter, go ahead. I can hear you, Raymond, yeah. Okay, very good. Thanks, Peter. Go ahead. We we would just slide that we we're, we're in charge of your slide. So, uh, just let's start with the beginning. And oh, be mindful, right. we have just five minutes left. Sorry about that. <laughs> I was about to go make a cup of tea, but uh, no yeah. problem. <laughs> <laughs> so go ahead. All right, but I can't see the slides. Mm -hmm. But. <clears throat> Why don't you read uh, or, or just speak while we're trying to get the pictures up? Uh, sure. I don't have the slides in front of me because I thought you were going to present them. Yeah, um, me, me too. But I guess since there's only a few minutes left, I could just make a few points. Um, okay. So... The first, I suppose, is um, to agree pretty much with what. Ah, oh, there we go. I think your your, your slides are up. Okay, let's quickly it? go. Let's quickly yeah. go to the third slide because I think the first two have largely been addressed. This um, one. Yes, I thought this okay. might be quite useful to contextualise the plurilaterals uh, issue. So the top chart is a heat map that shows who is participating in plurilaterals. So the hotter the regional country, like, like Australia, which is where I am now, or uh, Canada or Europe, uh, the more they participate or the more promiscuous they are vis-a-vis -vis participation in plurilaterals. And there's an obvious picture that emerges. It captures what we all know, but it's still quite interesting to see it represented graphically. So it's, it's basically an OECD story, uh, but LDCs, particularly uh, Africa and South Asian uh, countries are notably absent. So that's the top part of the slide. At, in the bottom section, what this is showing is the various plurilateral stroke JSIs that are underway and have been concluded. Uh, and again, the size of the horizontal bars showing how many countries are participating per plurilateral. Um, but also it's showing, it's on a slider scale, the human development index. So the further to the right, the bar is waste or weighted, um, the higher the level of development. So again, that's just reinforcing the point that plurilaterals are largely the developed country problem. And then per the last bullet on the slide that raises the obvious political economy question um, along the lines of, of what inhibits um, poor countries, particularly developing countries more generally from participating in plurilaterals. Is it a function of uh, 
of government capacities, as a suspicion of the process, uh, particularly in light of the fact that, in, in my view, these JSIs are very much in those countries' economic and social interests. Or, you know, maybe it's the logic of, of reciprocity. This is taken from a Think20 policy brief that was recently published under the Italian presidency. If we go to the next slide. Um, so this raises the obvious question of how to promote inclusivity of uh, uh, participation in plurilaterals, as well as their effectiveness without losing the project, as it were, without losing momentum. Uh, and so we've, in our Think20 policy brief, really separated that into three components. So the first is where is the leadership going to come from? And we think that could come from the G20 member states as the self point and steering group for the global economy. Uh, and they should be promoting these discussions, but also uh, mobilizing financial support to help developing countries to build their trade capacities. So we need more of that. What they could also be doing, but this could happen in Geneva particularly, is to identify the common elements in these plurilaterals. So because time is compressed, I won't elaborate, but basically we're concerned that that plurilaterals are proliferating and there is also the potential for some contradictions to emerge. So there could be benefit to identifying the common elements such, such as the various transparency elements in the different plurilaterals. And that suggests that the WTO secretariat should be more empowered because it's well placed to lead that kind of identification process. But you could also extend that WTO secretariat role. And we know this is a little bit controversial, but we put it out there, for, for instance, by empowering the WTO secretariat to conduct both ex ante impact assessments, but also ex post evaluations of JSIs. Have they succeeded on their merits? And then overall to increase transparency by conducting negotiations in the open. So people are suspicious of what they don't understand. Um, so the more transparency, the better. And then the final slide, I think, um, it's just an advertorial for our Think20 policy brief. So that's that's it, Raymond, in, in three minutes. <laughs> Join us, uh, Pradi Mehta. But uh, he has prepared the presentation. He has also speaking notes. I think I will get back to our colleagues with cuts. So what he has prepared could be shared, including also what has been prepared by the other speakers. Well, ladies and gentlemen, it's almost 10 years ago, I organized a similar panel to one of the public forum at that time. Well, I, I sincerely hope that it will, doesn't have to take another 10 years for <laughs> for those of us who are still around to discuss this topic and that we would in that sense see <clears throat> the light at the end of the tunnel as has been raised said by both speakers here to my right there are solutions possible um, and the avenues are already in a way laid out if there is political will and also to build on what peter just mentioned before if it is seen from the perspective of, for instance, the developing countries as something beneficial and not an exclusion of where they're at, but in that sense, an opportunity to catch up with the developed world. Um, for me, as a way to close, I would like to say, and as a reminder, one thing which was a bit missing uh, is in this discussion, um, is what I would say are the SDGs. I think if we sincerely take into account what the SDGs could mean, particularly SDG 1710, which says <clears throat> to promote a universal rules-based open and non-discriminatory and equitable multilateral trading system under the World Trade Organization including through the conclusion of negotiations under the Doha development uh, uh, agenda. So <clears throat> in other words, I think we have people also colleagues here in the WTO, 
who focus on the SDGs. I think the SDGs are meant to be inclusive, participatory, equitable, and in that sense, in finding inclusions of those who feel excluded at this point about all these plurilateral agreements, either because they don't understand uh, in detail what they're all about, but I think also with some, with some concerns that the, the plurilaterals, whatever they are, or whatever they might be in the future, might not necessarily help them to catch up and to get their economy and their uh, country out of poverty. So um, I'm coming to the end. Uh, thank, thank you all for your patience. And we have questions that I just hear from my uh, colleague moderator. As I said at the very beginning, we collect the, the, your questions. We'll share it with our uh, colleague speakers. And ideally at the end, maybe also together with uh, our friends from Cuts, who unfortunately couldn't participate at Party Meta, we might find a way to get back to you uh, to continue this emerging dialogue and maybe also the emerging discussions for solutions to take this into a, a positive and constructive next step. Thank you very much and goodbye.